afternoon, everybody. Um, again, my name is Dr. Taylor Clem with UFI Fist Extension, Nassau County, and uh, welcome to our first quarterly program of 2022 for the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. So we call this a Florida Friendly Landscaping like crash course. Uh, and each quarter throughout the year, we kind of jump into the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, but we really put emphasis on some of the specific components of it. Um, just so we can learn about it in a little bit more detail, um, just so it makes us more aware of some of the things that we are doing within our landscapes and how we're managing our landscapes. So in the chat box, how many of you are currently aware of what the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is? Or if you're not aware, let me know. Um, have, you, have you all seen that term before or heard of that term? Put that in that chat box. A lot of yeses and awares, wonderful. Unaware, great. Great. So yeah, so the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. So let's put it in a little bit of context. Um, oh, welcome. I'm gonna be in Clay County tomorrow. <laughs> Um, so put in a little bit of context to what the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is, you know, we're going to focus on that fertilizers and pesticides recommendations as part of the F in the context of the FFL program, why it's important that we consider those uh, when we're managing our landscapes, whether it be our homes, or, um, it could be commercial areas, new developments, any landscape that's being managed, we're thinking about Florida, the fertilizers and pesticides, and we can use these FFL practices. But let's think about it, how it's important state wide. So um, I want to show us a map um, of Florida. So um, I know we have one person from Clay County. Um, I know we have a lot of people from Nassau County, but um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is kind of looking at, this is looking at population projections of the state through 2060. This is from a, the Florida 2060 plan. Um, and there are newer updates to it. It's not too different. Um, but this is looking at current development or development as of 2005. What you can see in the red, that is developed land. So that's residential, commercial, institutional, et cetera. Um, the dark green, that is kind of like conservation, forests, state parks, et cetera. Um, and everything else, it's like agriculture or anything that doesn't fall within that like developed land use. So when we look at the state and the state's trends in how we're using water, how we're using managing our landscapes, you know, we see that there is a lot of consumption there. There is higher consumption. But then we can kind of say, OK, we know between 2005 and 2060 that the state's population is expected to double. And based off of that and knowing what those population projections are and based off of what that development pattern is going to look like, we have the ability as part of this plan, researchers that put this together, um, we're able to kind of anticipate what that development or that developed area of Florida is going to look like when we double our population by 2060. And this is that map that they developed. Um, and there are some minor fluctuations that have happened to the, the new update, but it's pretty similar to this. Um, and you can definitely tell by just knowing what you know about your area, you're seeing how true this is um, in development, etc. So, you know, when we think about consumption and water use and how we're using natural resources for managing our landscapes, we can anticipate that if the population is going to double, then that demand on those natural resources for landscape management is going to double. And another big concern is those pollutants associated with um, nitrogens and phosphorus is that are used within landscapes and making sure how are we using those appropriately to limit uh, any type of pollution that ends up in our waterways. So that population, like I mentioned, is expected to double by 2060 from that 2005. There's increased water demand, increased uh, impacts or threatens of uh, pollution, and as well as going to be decreased habitats that help filter a lot of that runoff before it returns to the aquifer, ends up in our surficial water bodies. Um, and in addition, when we have a decrease of those natural habitats, you have an increase in flooding and storm events, which then in itself leads to erosion and poorer water quality. Um, so the habitats are vitally important, but we're losing a lot of those as part of the development. But um, 
that's just these projections based off of what we're seeing with the population change throughout the state. So it does raise concern. So therefore, that makes us think about our landscapes, especially our landscapes, because a study in Central Florida has shown that about 60% of homeowner water usage is attributed to land, lawn and landscape irrigation. That's a lot of water. So 60% of residential use in that study is used for, is used for irrigation. Uh, In-ground irrigation, like you can see in the image on the left, that's a lot of water use. And if you think about every single home, individual homes, a neighborhood, a community, a city, all those homes potentially using water, that adds up very quickly, especially if we're growing and those demands are growing as well. Um, and, you know, algal blooms, those green algal blooms that we see a lot throughout the state, those are primarily attributed to non-point source pollutions like nitrogen and phosphorus, and our fertilizers is a source of that. And storm runoff, excess of irrigation can put a lot of those nutrients into the water, as well as some other impacts related to like pesticide and sector side usage and how it ends up in our water bodies and impacts uh, water quality significantly. So it's like, wow, our 60% of our water is used for lawn and uh, ir landscape irrigation. That's a lot of water. And especially for thinking about how our population is expected to double, um, that makes you think that's going to put a lot of stress on Florida's natural resources. And that's why the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is so important. So the essential questions that I want us to talk about and cover today, you know, once we go through this program, you should be able to answer these big questions. What is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program? Why is it important to fertilize my landscape appropriately? How do I fertilize my landscape properly? And then how do I manage landscape pests? properly. So we're going to cover, we're going to jump into detail, but we're still going to be covering a lot of the surface um, on these specific fertilizers and pesticides discussion. So let's talk more about what the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is. So we learned that there's importance in how our population is changing and 60% of our landscape is, water usage associated with the water quality or water usage, and that has impacts on water quality, then it's important for us to think, how do we manage our landscapes? Because A, it's important for the environment. B, if I have the ability to reduce my water usage in my landscape, that saves me money. Um, and then See, then we can save our well save ourselves a lot of money because if we actually follow the best management practices for lawn and landscape, it actually significantly reduces the amount of inputs that go into the, your landscape for management. And we'll learn a lot about that as we go through the program today. So the Florida Free Landscaping Program, what is it? So it is it's just an integrative approach. It's a fancy word saying it's how we're looking at managing our landscape to make sure it's attractive, it's colorful, and it's a very diverse yard. It's friendly to wildlife, it's environmentally responsible, and it's less that work than a traditional landscape, kind of. It really depends on how intensive the landscaping that you personally want to do, how intensive of a gardener you are. But if we just like do basic comparison of landscapes and we follow Florida friendly compared to like a traditional model maintenance, then Florida friendly is significantly less management than a traditional yard. Um, and they can significantly reduce water. They can conserve water and protect water quality. They can, those are the big goals of it, but it can also um, reduce, uh, sorry, it can help create habitats, uh, provide habitats uh, for wildlife, increase biodiversity, create healthy environments for us to live. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping, it's just kind of like that big statewide landscaping program that we use to help us determine and direct how we're going to manage our landscapes by following those science-based uh, information and research that we do throughout the state uh, as part of University of Florida IFAS Extension. So to kind of like help organize this uh, Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, we actually broke it down into nine principles. So those nine principles start off with right plant, right place. And we'll talk a little bit about that today because that's, I think, the, one of the most important components of the entire Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. So right plant, right place, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pests, recycle, reduce stormwater runoff and protect the waterfront. So our goal is to talk about, you know, through these quarterly programs, we 
this crash course program is we talk about all these nine principles in depth. But today we're really going to focus on those that relate to fertilizers and pesticides. So we're going to talk about right plant, right place, fertilize appropriately, mulch, and attract yard I'm sorry, <laughs> manage yard pests. You don't want to attract yard pests. We're going to do the opposite of that. Um, so right plant, right place, fertilize appropriately, mulch, and manage yard pests. So that's what we're going to really kind of focus on our conversations today. So um, let's go ahead and jump into that first principle, right plant, right place. And this is most important. Every single quarterly program that we do as part of this crash course, we're going to talk about right plant, right place, because that's the first step in making sure that we're having a landscape that essentially can help manage itself and reduce any type of inputs and the maintenance requirements that come from us. I like to tell people I want to be a lazy gardener and being a lazy gardener means having a landscape that's well thought out and planned so that I don't have to do as much in it. So I get to enjoy it rather than have to worry about working in it. Um, so right plant, right place. So right plant, right, plant, right place. Um, you know, if you ever watched uh, this old house, uh, I think the the main landscaping guy on there, Roger, he says this every episode like five times, but right plant, right place. What does that mean? So essentially, right plant, right place is that we have different environmental conditions, spaces in our yards that have different environmental conditions that plants would love to that plants do thrive in. So we want to make sure that we select the appropriate plants that grow well in those conditions. So a great, a great example of an environmental condition is the amount of sunlight. Do you have full sun, part sun, uh, full shade? Um, because some plants prefer full shade, some plants prefer full sun. And the minute we start to take a plant and move it out of its natural area or the area that it prefers, then it's not going to do well. It's going to be stressed. It's going to attract pests. It's going to make it harder to keep alive. And more than likely, it's going to end up failing. And you're going to have to do a lot of work to try to keep it away, alive. Rather than if we select plants, it's, oh, I got a full sun position place. I'm going to make sure I'm going to put plants in there that prefer full sun. I don't have a lot of rain. I don't have much irrigation. I'm going to make sure I'm selecting plants that are drought tolerant too. So what are some of those environmental conditions that you can think of that's going to be important when we're trying to select plants? Go ahead and put that in the chat box. What are some of those conditions that you think about when needing to select plants? Soil moisture, absolutely. How much moisture do you have available? Some plants, they need to be in water all the time. So you're not going to put them in soil somewhere that drains really well that you'd have to keep watering all the time to keep happy, happy and healthy. So absolutely, how much moisture is in water is available. Um, other things is, <clears throat> yeah, anything that thrives on neglect basically with no water. So if we follow right plant, right place, then once a plant is established majority of the time, you don't even have to touch it unless we're in periods of bad drought. Um, and I can give you some numbers on that too, if we wanted, but yeah, they, they can use very little water. So they're, if selected properly. So you're going to have environmental conditions like full sun. You're going to have areas that have drain really, really well. Um, soil pH, that's a great one. Salt tolerance, especially if you're on the coastal community. Um, those are all going to influence um, the type of plants that you can select. And don't worry, I'll send you resources on how you can actually select the environmental conditions and we'll It'll pull up the plants that do really well in that area. Yes, climate. So what zone do you live in? So what's going to happen in Nassau County this weekend? Put that in the chat box. <laughs> do, do we have, you know, 
we're going to have a big old freeze. So you're going to, yeah, it's going to get real cold. I think, I think it says it's going to get 25 degrees. So obviously, you know, North Florida, we get freezes. We can get really cold nights. Now, of course, the 25 degrees, that's pretty low uh, for us still, but I'm not going to put anything. I, you know, again, I want to be a lazy gardener. I don't want to have to cover plants unless I absolutely have to. And if I'm having to cover plants, then that might be a good sign that that plant might be the wrong plant for the wrong place because if it can't tolerate our cold snaps, then it might not be the most appropriate plant for our environment. So we kind of look at climate based off of the hardiness zone through USDA and it's kind of based off of like 10 degree increments on the average winter low um, and in Nassau County, we are actually split between two different zones. Western part of Nassau County, so if you're pretty much Callahan West, um, you're going to be in 8B, um, especially on that northern along St. Mary's River, et cetera, et cetera you're going to be 8B, that's the zone classification. And if you're on the east part of the county, um, you're going to be 9A. Um, I've heard a lot of people mention that we're 9B, but we're not. Um, we are not 9B. We still get way too cold for 9B. So there's a lot of tropical plants that will die uh, this weekend uh, unless they are protected. Um, I saw a lot of blue days that died from our last freeze. <laughs> um, but anyways, so climate is super, super important. So we started to make sure that we, if we select the plants that prefer full sun or or sorry, that match the environmental conditions that we're planting. So if we're planting full sun, select plants that love full sun. If we're planting deep shade, make sure we're selecting plants that like deep shade. Because the minute that we match those conditions, the plants naturally thrive and you don't really have to worry about them much. But it's also really important to think about the plants that might do too terribly well. By any chance, do you all know what picture this is? What image is in this picture? What plant is that? Seen it a little bit in Nassau County. Not much, thankfully. Whew. Yes, that's right. Coral Ardesia. Coral Ardesia is one of our noxious weeds. It's highly, highly invasive. Those little berries right there, you know, one uh, Coral Ardesia will get covered in hundreds of berries and they have a very high efficiency of germination and they pop up everywhere. So um, we need to think about invasive species. There are a lot of invasive species um, that are considered noxious. So they're actually illegal to buy, sell or trade or transport without permit, um, like Coral Ardesia, other ones that we have here like Brazilian pepper. Um, we also have uh, air potato, and I mean, we've got quite a bit, but um, uh, tuberous sword fern, I uh, see that a lot. But, oh, sorry, that's not a noxious weed, but that is one of the invasive plants. So we have noxious weeds, but we also just have regular invasive species, other ones that aren't necessarily illegal to buy, sell, or trade. So like tuberous sword fern, you can go to the store and you can buy that and you can put it in your landscape and then a year later, it's going to be everywhere. Um, and it's going to start killing off a lot of those natural areas and it pops up in natural habitats. So it's important to make sure that we're not selecting invasive plants as well. Um, skunk vine, yeah, that's another one. Oh man, skunk vine. Cat's claw, uh, that's another invasive vine. Um, so we have to be really aware. And then lastly, for right plant, right place, um, I think about functionality. How are you using a landscape? Um, and also think about how does a landscape change? Uh, one of my landscaping pet peeves, um, and I've, I've, you all have probably heard me say this before, but one of my landscaping pet peeves is a, um, a uh, sweet viburnum or any large shrub that's planted in front of a window of a house because those want to grow and they're going to cover up those windows and you're going to constantly have to prune the plants to keep them to a form that keeps them out of the window and that's going to end up killing the plant eventually. Um, so it's like, why do that? Why not just pick a plant that grows nice and low and looks really nice and you don't have to prune at all? So think about how those plants change and think about how that function of the landscape may change. So good example, um, I have a backyard, St. Augustine grass grows well there. Um, I'm going to slowly bring in some more ornamental plants, but I also have two little kids that are 
crazy, you know? Um, so they go in the backyard and play around a lot. So if I was going to do some alternative ground covers in the yard, I could do them, but they may not live up to the trampling of kids running around on the yard but nonetheless i'm making sure that that it, it is the right plant for the right place and i'm managing it following our best management practices like i haven't irrigated my turf grass since post-establishment back in november um saying it's still doing wonderful but um it's important to think about how does landscape function change um and that's gonna have an impact on how we make decision uh decisions for a landscape so that's right plant, right place. So let's go ahead and we'll jump right into principle three. This is now where we talk about fertilize appropriately. So fertilizing appropriately, this is a big one. So nutrients, oh, that's a time slide. Um, nutrients, they're important. They're an important component of our landscape. Our plants need nutrients in order to grow, in order to thrive, in order to reproduce. So therefore, in situations, we do apply fertilizers to help provide nutrients when nutrients are needed. But it's important to know that we need to fertilize appropriately. Don't just go out and it's like, oh, four times a year, I throw down 10, 10, 10 on my landscape and my landscape's healthy and happy. Yeah, not really, kind of. Um, what's happening is you're putting, you might be putting down way too much nutrients. So you're actually wasting a a lot of it. So your plants aren't uptaking it. You might be burning your roots, um, creating thatch, which brings in insects and bugs. Um, and then when you're losing any type of that nutrient, that's going into our water bodies in some capacity, whether groundwater or surface water. Um, and then also you're wasting money. You're, you're spending excess of money for something that your landscape does not need. But the most important part of any type of landscape management is to do a soil test. Because to fertilize appropriately, you have to understand, do I need to actually put down any nutrients? How do I do that? And that starts with a soil test. There's some conditions that we need to follow in order to do, so, to, um, sorry, there's some environmental conditions that can impact our soil conditions, which can then influence when and how much nutrients we do need to put down when needed. So it's always important to do a soil test. We do soil pH tests inside of our uh, county extension office. So we can help get those to you and how to make those adjustments or to help you select plants to do best in your existing soil. So fertilize appropriate. So why do we fertilize? So going back to that, so plants need nutrients. So why do we fertilize? So they need that nutrients to grow. Um, and the needs of plants actually vary significantly by species, age, soil type, geographic location, um, and also as well as the time of year. So like right now, obviously, you wouldn't be really putting down too many nutrients on a lot of our ornamental plants, uh, but you might be putting them down on some of our like fruit producing plants uh, just because they need that coming out of dormancy. So why do we fertilize? We try to make sure that if there are nutrients that are needed to be added, we're adding them appropriately. But there's a lot of conditions that can impact when, the timing, and how much. So it is important to fertilize responsibly to uh, maximize the uptake of plants. So you don't want to put down too much. You don't want to put down too little. You got to get it just right if you're going to be putting it down. Um, so the timing, the amount that you put down or that rate, that nutrient source can have a big impact on the quality of those nutrients or how that fertilizer is used. Um, looking at the fertilizer analysis, and we'll talk about that fertilizer analysis and then the application method. But it's important to just always come back to improperly or excessively applied nutrients have a huge impact on our water quality. There's multiple different sources that impact our water quality as with regards to nitrogen and phosphorus and fertilizers from our lawns and landscapes are a major one of them. So, and it leads to the algae blooms that we can have in our, throughout the state. Um, you know, I remember when in, back in the uh, 2000s, we had a major algal bloom in the St. John's River. And this picture is in the St. John's River, but it looks like this. Um, you just see green, giant swaths of algal, algae uh, just uh, flowing through the river. Um, and it can actually, that nutrients that you put down, um, if you put down too much, it can actually make pest issues worse. It creates pest issues because stimulating excess growth in the plants, 
the plants can't, roots can't keep up with that growth um, and that attracts more pests to that landscape. And then it just leads to that cause that runoff and that pollution. So over fertilizing our landscapes has significant problems. So your plants need nutrients. So if we're going to be applying, we need to make sure that we're doing it appropriately. And again, it starts with a soil test. The first step is the fertilizer. The first step to fertilizing appropriately is soil test. Like I mentioned before, you can come by, you can do soil test, pH test in our county office, but we can also send off soil samples to the state soils testing lab. And they'll look at uh, those macro and micronutrients in your soils. Um, and they'll give you actually feedback based off of what you're growing, if it's turf grass, ornamental shrubs, um, they'll give you recommendations on how to fertilize your landscape appropriately based off of uh, our environmental conditions or our soil type, et cetera. And that, those science-based information or science um, recommendations that we've developed through all of our research. So here's some proper fertilizer practices that we need to consider. Always read the label. Always, always, always read the label. It's very easy for us to go out and just go to the store. Oh, here's fertilizer. I'm going to buy it. Um, always make sure you're reading the fertilizer label because sometimes, you know, you shouldn't be applying weed and feed. You shouldn't be using it. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but you can easily purchase the wrong one and it can do way worse than good. Um, as well as the timing and how it releases the new, those nutrients may not be appropriate because we're going to talk about slow release fertilizers here in a second. Store any unused fertilizer in a dry area. So in your garage, in a shed is really nice. I encourage keeping it a little elevated up off the ground. Um, Never fertilize within 10 feet of any water body. That's part of the FFL program is protecting the waterfront. We call that the low maintenance zone because those plants that rather than putting like turf grass down um, along a water body, we can plant the nice ornamental shrubs along the water body. And what that will end up doing is those plants will help intercept a lot of those pollutants that are running through the soil or on the surface before they enter water and in helps significantly in reducing pollutants. A lot of our farmers have been doing this for years, uh, buffers along creeks and streams and rivers to help protect any type of nutrient runoff. And we've seen significant improvements in water quality in the Gulf of Mexico since the uh, starting those buffer practices in the mid 20th century, uh, mid to late 20th century. So never put anything down uh, 10 feet within the water from the water. Use a fertilizer spreader with a deflector shield. So that's like the little shield that you can actually have when you're pushing your uh, your spreader. It has a shield that prevents fertilizers from throwing, going onto a roadway, a sidewalk, a driveway, um, going towards water bodies. So it kind of helps direct the angle of that throw a little bit of the fertilizers just to prevent it from uh, being applied where it shouldn't be. Um, be sure your spreader is uh, properly calibrated. We'll talk a little bit about that, um, to how to, how to calibrate your, your spreaders. Um, and there's more things that you can do beyond just our discussion that we have today. But let's talk about when to apply fertilizers. So when to apply fertilizer is really important. So it's going to be determined by the time of year, our climate, soil type, and species and health of grass. So if we're fertilizing our grass, it's gonna be important to know what kind of species and if that, those health conditions can have an impact on how we apply or when we apply. So it's important to know that when we fertilize is determined by on the in the state. So in uh, North Florida, our warm season turf grasses go dormant. So you look around the town and the, the county now, you're seeing that a lot of those tor turf grasses look brown. Um, and that's just because the plant, the, the turf grass is sleeping pretty much. And because of that, you shouldn't be fertilizing um, your turf grass at all. And um, we will actually apply our first um, fertilizer application in April. Um, that's based off of that when the turf grass starts to come out of dormancy and it's actively growing again. So we're only applying uh, fertilizers during that active growing season for our turf grass. Um, and there's some other variabilities with some specific other ornamental plants, but during that main growing season, that's when we're gonna be predominantly applying fertilizers. And in this case, that April through September timeframe for North Florida. 
do not fertilize if heavy rain is expected within 24 to 36 hours because we don't want a big flush of nutrients. You want them to kind of be able to stay um, in your soil profile. And if we get a lot of rain, uh, it can end up pushing a lot of those nutrients really quickly beyond the roots of those plants. And then you're uh, losing your efficiency. So it's important to, if you're thinking about applying um, your fertilizer on like a Saturday and you see it's supposed to rain on Sunday or that Monday, then don't apply fertilizers. It's better to wait after than try to rush and get it done um, <clears throat> because you don't want to misapply at all. So that's important to think about when to apply is that growing season and make sure there's no heavy rains that are going to be coming in um, 24 to 36 hours after that application. So now let's talk a little bit about selecting a fertilizer. So there's different types of fertilizers that you can get, um, but it's also important. And then we'll talk about how to read those labels so we can have a little bit better understanding of what type of fertilizer we are purchasing from the store. So there's two... Um, <clears throat> There's two different types of fertilizers types. There's a quick release uh, fertilizer and there's a slow release. So just simply put, slow release, that's it. Only buy slow release fertilizers, never buy a quick release fertilizer. Quick release fertilizers that use a quick release nitrogen, that nutrient has to be uptake so, so quickly that um, that nutrient will be gone and through the soil profile in less than 30 days or around 30 days, uh, 30 to 60 days. I can't remember the number all of a sudden, but it's gone. You lose it quicker than the plants can uptake it. Slow release nitrogen or slow release fertilizers is always going to be best because what it does is they're uh, just different coated nutrients and they're coated in different ways. Um, but what they do is they slowly break down that coating and it releases those nutrients more evenly throughout the course of like 90 to 120 days. So you can put down nutrients or a fertilizer in April and it'll last you into the summer and then you can put down another application then based off of the turf grass requirements, of course, or that, ground, that uh, plant that you're needing to fertilize. Sorry. Um, but usually we put down slow release, it slowly releases that nutrient out to the plants based off of the plant's needs. So you're having a much higher efficiency in usage. You don't have to fertilize as much and um, you're able to uh, reduce the amount that you're putting down at a time. So um, I got two questions that just came in. Why are lawn companies allowed to apply when they want to, regardless of rain coming? So, um, with so yes, you will see people, professional or private, doesn't matter, um, apply, and they will be applying during this time period. There, this is we know a period in which there is um, heavy loss of nutrients right after application, and if there's a rain coming in, but. That's a recommendation, a best management practice that everyone should be following. There's nothing requiring that that uh, should be done. Should it be? That's a whole other discussion. Um, and then the next question, is compost slow release? Ye kind of, it depends, <laughs> but it definitely does help. So compa compost, because it has really high organic matter, holds on to nutrients really, really well. So um, it does what we call buffer the soil as well, but it had that organic matter helps hold on to a lot of nutrients. So it significantly reduces any type of nutrient loss. Um, so it does make it seem like it's slow release, but it's not necessarily, compost isn't necessarily a fertilizer either, but it can really, really help because it is loaded with nutrients. So, and I do know that you can use compost in lieu of a fertilizer because of its high nutrient content. Um, so that, that is a good question. So it, it kind of acts like slow release in a way, but it's not necessarily this fits within the same definition. So hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> Um, so then we can look at a fertilizer bag. So we know we have a quick release and slow release. You should be using a slow release fertilizer. That's what you need to be using. There are some situations where you can't use quick release, but it's very rare, very, very rare. So we have uh, the, 
the guaranteed analysis. So when we look at a bag, it has three big numbers on it. And um, they are, are some of our macronutrients. So they're like the most heavily used nutrients by plants. Um, and they're always going to be, there's three different times. There's your primary and your secondary. Your primary is the one that a lot of people are always concerned about talking about. It's the most commonly used. And that's those three big numbers on your fertilizer bag. And those three big numbers are N, P, and K. So that's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Um, and every single label of fertilizer is always going to be using the same type of, or the same order of numbers. It's always going to be NPK. It never changes. The only thing that does change is that number. And that number is just a percentage. How much of that bag percent, percentage is of that nutrient? So say at a hundred pound bag of that 1608, that hundred pound bag, 16% of it is nitrogen. Zero, there's no phosphorus and 8%. Is potassium. So that just translates to that 100 pound bag, 16 pounds of it is nitrogen. There are zero pounds of phosphorus and there are eight pounds of potassium. So that grade, that's what we call that, that 1608. Um, we can, we can use those numbers to determine how much of the fertilizers that we need to put down based off of the number that we have um, or based off of what we're fer fertilizing. And it's important to also know when we're thinking about how nutrients impact our water quality, two of those macronutrients are so important for our plants to be happy and healthy. I mean, all these are important, but some of those two macronutrients, nitrous and nitrogen and phosphorus, those are our two contributors to non-point source pollutants. Those are two big ones, nitrogen and phosphorus. So it's important to always think that phosphorus, phosphorus should always be zero unless you have a soil test saying that you need to apply phosphorus. Do you all know why? Put that in the chat box if you know why. Why is phosphorus, why should it be zero? It's a obviously it's a contributor to non-soil point, point source pollutants, but if plants need phosphorus, why are we recommending zero? It's a tough one, I'll give another second. Yeah, absolutely. So phosphorus, we have plenty of it already in our soils. <laughs> and it's a, a natural, it's a more of a natural form of phosphorus rather than a synthetic form of phosphorus. And so it's held naturally in our soil really, really well. So if we apply any type of phosphorus, then your plants aren't going to be using it. It's going to be leaching. It's going to be in excess. And it's going to contribute to pollution, non-point source pollution, and impact our water quality. So that's why it's important to never have use a, a fertilizer with phosphorus unless you have a soil test saying you are deficient or that you need to apply phosphorus. Um, I have seen soil tests come back that people needed to apply phosphorus, but it's actually very rare. So that, anyways, so those are the macronutrients on our uh, soil bags, the primary are nitri nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, NPK, but we also have secondary macronutrients, so those large, heavy consumed uh, nutrients. It's calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. So you'll usually see those in your fertilizer bag as well, because you'll see a label that guaranteed analysis gives you all the percentages. And I have an example of one coming up of a guaranteed analysis that we'll look at. But we also have micronutrients and different plants may require heavier amounts of micronutrients. So some of those like palms, oh boy, they're always getting like frizzle top. They're getting some other type of deficiencies from having limited micronutrients. So like boron, chlorine, copper, iron, these are all different nutrients that plants need, but they're usually just a smaller amounts that are required than those macronutrients. Um, and they may not always be needed. Sometimes your plants are wavy, gravy, happy, healthy without ever applying any type of micronutrient to them. Um, and you can apply these are usually like if you, you can go get palm fertilizer. So if you look at a palm fertilizer, palms need a lot of these micronutrients and you'll actually see uh, a lot of these micronutrients in a higher percentage than a well, they'll be there, <laughs> but then they may also be in a higher percentage compared to some other specialty fertilizers. So you can go get those specialty fertilizers that are more tailored 
for the specific plants that you are going to fertilize, like a, a palm tree. Palm trees are really good at telling us if there's a general nutrition uh, nutrient deficiency in a landscape. But anyway, so those are our micronutrients. So let's look at a label. So reading the label, that's so important when we're applying any type of fertilizer. So we have our N, P, and K. So that is eight. In this example, we have eight, two, and 10. 8% 8 nitrogen, 2% phosphorus, 10% potassium. And we can actually look at this label on the screen. I'm going to open up a little annotative thing so I can draw some pictures. Uh, but you can see that our nitrogen right here, it has 8%. So 8% nitrogen. So you can see how that matches up there um, very easily. Um, but this nitrogen is also, it's 8%, but it has two different forms. Uh, this ammonium nitrogen, as well as this urea nitrogen. So those are two different forms, but note this asterisk. That's going to be an important part because if we're thinking of, if we're going to say, hey, you need a slow release fertilizer, um, it's not always easy to read the label and say, oh, this is a slow release fertilizer. But look for this little asterisk and then you come down here and see what that says. It says 7.2% slowly available. So slow release nitrogen from polymer coated urea. So that's how it's coated. I said nitrogen can come in multiple coated ways, one of them which is poly uh, polymer coated urea. Um, but you can see it says 7.2% is slowly available. So to determine, oh, do I have slow release uh, fertilizer, our general rule of thumb is you have to have at least 30% of your nitrogen is slow release. So it's like, okay, how do I do that? You actually just take that number 7.2 and you divide it by eight. So in this situation, I'm actually opening up my cal calculator because <laughs> I don't have it. That's, if we do that 7.2 divided by eight, that comes out to 90%. Or the calcu calculator just reads 0.9. So that's how we, so it's like, okay, 90% is greater than 30%. So cool, that is a slow release fertilizer. Now, um, there are some situations where that number might be really low, where it could be like 2% is slowly available. So um, that's how you always check the label is you can look at the bottom of the label. It will always have that asterisk and how much is slow release um, and that percentage. And you just take this number, divide it by that total nitrogen in the bag, and that'll let you know if it's slow release or not. Um, and, but then you can look at the other labels. You have like phosphate or your phosphorus, uh, your potash, which is your potassium. Those are the forms that they come in. So you can see eight, two, ten. Um, man, that last line is pretty straight. But anyways, uh, the magnesium. So there is magnesium in this label. It's five percent. It's water soluble. That's okay. Sulfur. There's sulfur in here. The content, the forms that it comes in, and then the iron what, con what uh, form iron is, water-soluble iron. Um, so in, there's, there's, it's almost looking at your nutrition facts. It's, it's exactly as if you're looking at your nutrition label. It's showing those forms and percentages that everything comes in. But definitely when you're looking at the label, sometimes it can be a little bit more confusing. Sometimes it can be simpler than this. But always know that it's always going to have that slow-release percentage to allow you to determine if you have a slow-release fertilizer or not. And remember, 30% is our minimum to be considered a slow release fertilizer. Now in some counties, they actually have different number requirements. So the university, 30% is our benchmark. Uh, some counties actually have different ordinances. And um, like one example I know, they actually use 50%. So in order to use a fertilizer, you have to at least have 50% slowly available uh, nitrogen in your fertilizers. So um, anyways, so reading the label, remember eight to 10, so you know your grade, 8% nitrogen, 2% phosphorus, 10% potassium, and it's clearly labeled and listed those forms that it comes in on the label. So it can be a little daunting when you look at this, but every fertilizer label is gonna have this on there. Every fertilizer label, it has to, by law, it's important um, that that's a standard that is set up that you should be able to find that information.
So next is when you're going to the store and you may see some cool things that say, hey, weed and feed, I can put down an herbicide and my nutrients, my fertilizer at the same time. Cool. That helps me. That helps save me some time. No, don't do it. Um, I've seen a couple times happen in my career in extension. Um, I haven't been extension too terribly long, but I've been in my career in extension. I've seen a lot of people accidentally kill their lawns because they chose the wrong weed and feed mixture. Uh, there's a lot of herbicides that are safe for some turf grass types that will kill another. Um, so it's so important to, that we just avoid that, but also those herbicides can actually hurt and kill maybe even some of our other ornamental plants that we have in our landscapes if we're not applying them correctly. Um, so, and then another big condition is the best time to put down your herbicide is not the best time to put down your nutrients. Your best time to put down your herbicide is going to be as a pre-emergent in, in March, a whole month before you should be fertilizing your turf grass. So um, because you can put down your herbicide as a pre-emergent in March, uh, like March 1st for North Florida, and that will help control and manage a lot of those warm season turf grass weeds and keeping them from ever really popping up in the first place. Some will, will still break through regardless. But um, if we apply it in March to be most effective, a weed and feed, then the nutrients are going to be completely wasted. You're still going to have some kind of around when the turf grass awakes comes out of dormancy, but it's going to be a lot of loss that occurs in that period. Um, but on the other end of that, if we put down our fertilizer, um, in April, the appropriate time for our plants, and it has that herbicide in it, that herbicide is not going to be nearly as effective, and you're still going to get a bunch of weeds in your yard. It may impact some that have already grown, but it's not going to have a true tremendous impact as if you just did the appropriate timing in the first place. So just avoid weed and feed mixtures altogether. It's a waste of money. It, make, it looks convenient, but at the end of the day, it doesn't help. Um, so in any ways, you put a pot down pre-emergence, and then if anything else pops up, it's way easier just to spot treat your yard with herbicides if need be, or just hand pull versus just doing a blanket herbicide application. So let's talk about fertilizing turf grasses, just because that is one of our most predominant uh, landscape plant species that we have is turf grass. So, um, and because a lot of our ornamental plants once they're established, very rarely do you have to fertilize them. Um, but turf grass is very consumptive based off of how quickly it grows and how much it grows. So we have recommendations specifically if you're growing turf grass and it's the right plant for the right place, we have that science-based recommendations that support this is how you fertilize turf grass to limit and reduce loss. And in our uh, in the field studies and the trials that they do down outside of Gainesville, they actually have like 99.9% .9 uptake efficiency of nutrients. Um, of course, that's lab um, and it's all outdoor nonetheless, but it's being sought after and watched closely all the time. But it's still important to say that, hey, we follow these. If you're following turf grass 100% appropriately, you have really nice efficiency with your fertilizer use. So it's important to think about. Um, but because there are benefits of having a healthy lawn. And we'll talk a little bit about calculating fertilizer amounts and how to apply those fertilizers um, before we jump into the pesticide last section of our program today. So let's talk about the benefits of a healthy lawn. So if you do have a healthy lawn, it helps hold the soil in, in place um, because if you have bare soil, especially on like steep slopes, or if there is a slope, it leads to a lot of erosion. It can actually filter stormwater runoff. Um, it can reduce heat, noise, and glare within an urban setting. It can reduce this dirt tracked into home. Uh, it can serve as a fire break if you're in a fire prone area. Um, and it can be a backdrop for people to play, et cetera. So there are some other benefits, but it's not always the most functional for some homeowners. So if you have a lot of uh, canopy and trees, then turf grass isn't going to work well because turf grass needs a lot of sun. Um, even our shade tolerant varieties, you're still going to need some uh, sunlight. But anyway, so there are some benefits of having a healthy lawn environmentally, but that's only if they're going to be managed appropriately. So um, 
first off, when you're calculating your fertilizer amount, it's important to know how big of an area you're going to fertilize. Because all of our rates that we give for your turf grass type is based off of the rate of a thousand per thousand square feet. So, you know, you need to know how much of an area you're going to be fertilizing so you know how much you need to put down. So measure the property and calculate square footage of the turf grass area, not the landscape beds, just your turf grass area. I usually recommend breaking it up in different sections. So you can have your front, your back, your side yards. This allows, it, allows you to chunk it and make it a little bit more manageable when you're trying to develop that square footage. Um, so you just, you know, basic geometry, uh, length times width, and just try to get the most accurate uh, square footage of your turf grass area or the area that you're fertilizing. That's a better way to put it, that area that you're going to fertilize. Um, I actually have a little map of my house, and I actually have all those areas um, already calculated out because that's me. <laughs> but uh, I keep it on a clipboard in the garage. But nonetheless, nonetheless, measure it so that it makes it easier when you actually do those calculations. Um, you know, so if you have really, you're not always going to have really irregular, you're going to, you may have very irregular shaped turf grass areas. So, you know, try to approximate the best you can using different shapes, squares, rectangles, triangles to come up with the most appropriate or closest, most accurate uh, square footage that you can. There's some really cool devices now that I actually find very helpful. They're like free apps, like on your phone, you, you hold your phone and you just like follow your property edge. And it'll draw a little map of where you walked and it'll tell you that square footage. So that's super handy, uh, especially if you don't, if this gets too complicated, uh, you can do that and we'll say, oh, you have X percent square footage and it's pretty accurate. It's really cool um, if you have good service, of course. Um, so you gotta measure that landscape because that's how you determine how much you apply of nitrogen per a thousand square feet. So in North Florida, so these are annual nitrogen recommendations. Um, for our turf grasses. So we have Bahia, Centipede, St. Augustine, and Zoysia. Um, Bermuda is another turf grass that people use, but it's just so consumptive. I, um, I can give those numbers if you have Bermuda, but it's usually Bermuda is not used by homeowners because of how intensive it can be with inputs um, because it is a hungry little grass uh, nonetheless. So looking at those, um, <clears throat> Those recommendations for North Florida, these are the recommendations that are the pounds of nitrogen per a thousand square feet. Um, so looking at Bahia grass, you can do one to three pounds per year. Centipede 0.4 to two. St. Augustine is two to four and Zoysia is two to three. So usually, you know, um, and you, ne sorry, and then you never apply more than one pound of nitrogen at a per a thousand square feet at a time of the slow release fertilizer. So that means for a lot of these turf grasses, you might have to do it two or three times a year. But for most of us, if we have St. Augustine or Zoysia, um, you can get by with just two and your turf grass looks wonderful. Um, and Bahia and Centipede, you can get by with one and your turf grass will still look wonderful. Um, and the neat thing is if you do have centipede grass, look how low, low number that is. That's 0.4. Our recommendation used to be 0.5 and is reduced to 0.4. Um, so centipede is not that much. <laughs> um, and actually in centipede grass, if you start to apply too much nitrogen, it dies, it starts to die out. There's centipede grass decline if there's too much nitrogen. But those are our recommendations. And usually you can get by with just a one pound per thousand square feet or, uh, and that's all you'll need single application like the hay or centipede or St. Augustine and Zoysia. You can do an application in April. You can do one uh, then later in June. And then you can do that third one in the, towards the end of the season. So there's, uh, those are those tables, those charts. So it's really dependent on your turf grass type ultimately. So again, you go back to um, reading the label to say, okay, I need to figure out um, I need to figure out, do I, I have, if I have a slow release, then how much of this do I put down? If I need to put down one pound of nitrogen, that single application for a thousand square feet, and I have a bag that says I'm 8%, how, how do I do that? So um, it can be a little confusing at first, uh, but, you know, if say you have, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 
say you have an, this bag, it's an eight to two ten, and say you have an uh, eight percent of it is nitrogen. So if it's a hundred pound bag, then eight pounds of it is nitrogen. So you would have to put down like an eighth of that um, bag in order to get that application down. So, um, but you can just it's a simple calculation in order to do that. I'll share some uh, a cool little cheat sheet that we have that walks through that calculation, but that you have to use that label to determine how much you put down. And again, it's one pound per a thousand square feet, or one pound of nitrogen per a thousand square feet. So use a broadcast spreader. These are the easiest ones to walk behind. Predominantly, this is the ones that we're all using. Uh, use a deflector shield, like you can see in these images, that metal and plastic piece that you can switch over. Um, you have like, usually have like a little lever that you can move it over or you have to do it manually. Um, but also make sure that the spreader is in good operating condition. Because if you misapply fertilizer in the lawn or landscape, it could be a big issue. It can lead to death over too much nitrogen can burn the turf grass and kill it. Um, so usually what I recommend is, so you know the total application that you have to put down, put half in your spreader, apply half walking one direction. And then you can say, okay, I spread too, it spread too quick. I need to slow down how I spread it. Or if it's spread too slowly, I need to increase how I spread it. So you walk one direction with half and then you go perpendicular, walk the other direction back and forth the other half. Um, and that can make sure that you try to spread as uniformly as possible. Um, so, and then also make sure you close the spreader when you're turning, because every time you turn, it's like you're almost applying another, uh, if you turn while keeping it open, it's like you're spreading fertilizer again in that space. Um, and obviously when you're like in this image on the top where it's walking, where they can see they walk over a sidewalk, it's important to close the spreader when you're walking over any hardscapes, because. You don't want to fertilize that. And anytime that you spill any type of fertilizer, it's important to sweep it up and you can put it back in the bag. Um, anyways, um, fertilizer is a potential for leaching or runoff of nutrients um, directly related to the amount of water after fertilization. So sometimes it's important. That's why that 24 to 36 hours is so important when looking for rain because initially that's a lot of, when rain comes down, right after you apply a fertilizer, that can wash a lot of it away down the storm drains. Um, it can excess and nutrients can go through the soil profile, but it is also important that right after you uh, spread irrigation, put down just a little bit of water, like about a quarter of an inch of water in your irrigation. And what that does is any of the, the uh, granules that got trapped in any of the plants that you're using, that can help knock it down and get it down to the soil because otherwise that nitrogen that's on the leaf blades of any of our plants could end up burning it. So it, uh, that can help knock it down and make it get better onto the soil and protect it. All right, so that's fertilizing appropriately. It starts with a soil test. Um, and only apply if there's a deficiency in your soil. Um, look at, we can look at those pH, can determine if there's any adjustments that you need to do to improve uh, the, the soil uh, to help your turf grass be healthier um, or your plants be healthier. Um, but again, right plant, right place. If you follow right plant, right place, you may not have to put any type of nutrients down, very minimal. Um, and your landscape is going to be self-sufficient and never go above the number of recommendations that we give about the amount of nitrogen or, uh, fertilizers to put down. Um, and it can, and by following its best range of practice, it can significantly help reduce the amount that you put in down. Um, in some situations, um, I'm sorry, it can reduce the amount that you put down. It can help protect water quality um, and it can help make sure that if you're putting them down, you're using them as efficiently as possible. So uh, so now we'll jump into mulch. So mulch sometimes is like, oh, Taylor, why do we talk about mulch? Why is this important? Uh, there was a question earlier that someone mentioned about compost. And I mentioned that compost is a high organic matter. And what it does is it can help hold on to nutrients really well. And what it does is it can, it, bring in that organic matter um, and it almost becomes like it's a slow release fertilizer in itself. So mulching can help protect and build our soil. So as that organic matter starts to break down, what it does is it helps build that soil. And by helping build that soil, we actually have a much stronger landscape because a lot of Florida, our native soil has very thin 
layer of organic matter. Whereas, and it's just because of the type of parent material that makes our soils. Whereas you go to other parts of the United States, you could have, you know, four to six inches of organic matter in some areas significantly deeper. And that helps significantly with plant growth. So mulching can, mulch helps uh, slowly as it breaks down, it can help build soil. And what it will do is it can help reduce the amount of fertilizers that you may need in your landscape, especially for your ornamental plants. Um, but also what it does is it can protect, enhance the soil, but it can also help with weed suppression. Weed suppression is really nice because then you may not have to apply or limit the amount of type of hand pulling of weeds in your ornamental beds or your spraying of herbicides in your in your landscape beds so mulch works wonders for us um, but you need to have about a two to three inch layer i usually say you just use your middle finger um, and if you can stick your middle finger down through the mulch and touch the ground and your fingers completely in the mulch then it's a good depth if you have to dig down further it's too deep um, and if your finger's still sticking out some that's not deep enough so um Mulching also helps with soil moisture retention, so it helps reduce the amount of water that you're using in your landscape. So there's a lot of benefits from mulch, and then it can just have that aesthetic quality that it uh, can provide. So mulch is really, really important, but it can help become a tool for us to help manage some of those landscape pests like weeds. Um, but anyways, so that's mulch. Mulch is a really important principle. Um, I know sometimes it, it's like mulch, why is it important? mulch important? Well, it, it has a huge role they can play within our landscape. So. so now let's jump into the managing pests. So um, we talked about the fertilizers and why those fertilizers are so, so important, or sorry, nutrients are so important to plant material and fertilizers can be a tool for us to help give nutrients to plants when it's needed. Um, and we have best management practices to make sure that we follow those in order to reduce the types of uh, nutrient pollution that ends up in our waterways. And that starts with right plant, right place. And another thing that starts with right plant, right place is if we have happy, healthy plants, they are naturally resilient to landscape pests and landscape pest stress. So if we have a plant that's happy in the landscape, it might get a bad bug come in, but then that plant might be like, yeah, whatever, you know? Um, but if you have a plant that's the wrong plant, the wrong place, it's not being managed well, um, then it's going to be more stressed. And the minute a plant is stressed, it's going to have, I always joke that has a big neon light, it says all you can eat buffet flashing above it and all the bugs are going to come to it. Those bad insects, or a lot of those pests are attracted to stressed plants. So usually when we're thinking about managing a pest, usually it thinks about what, are, what can we do in our landscape culturally or how we're managing the landscape, because if we fix that, we can really fix the pest issue. But let's go back to think of like from the perspective of an insect, what is a pest? What is a pest? So um, how do we define a pest? So if we're thinking about insects, how, what percentage of insects do you think are actually considered problematic? What percent? You put that in the chat box. Percentage. Oh, that's a good guess. All right. So I've seen a few different, but yeah, it's um, like less than one, one percent, maybe kind of less than one percent. <laughs> so um, and that's just because of how diverse our insects and our species are that are within our landscape. It's actually only roughly about 1% of our landscape insects are considered pest or nuisance. Um, and you know, it's like, oh, wow. So what are the other plants? Well, what are the other pests? The other are uh, benign, they're just insects that are doing their insect thing, um, or they're actually predatory or beneficial. They're insects that we need like pollinators. We need pollinators. And did you know that um, homeowners are applying on average across the country 10 times more pesticides per acre on their lawns than farmers use on crops. That's significant. 10 times more than, we're, than farmers are using on crops. 
that's that's a lot. <laughs> that is a lot per acre. That's a that's a huge impact. So it's like okay. So um, then how do we reduce them? So one of the big problems that we've come up with in, before in the past is that oh, I have an insect in my yard. Spray. I have an insecticide. Go get an insecticide. Spray. Well, that creates an issue. So what happens if we start using excess of pesticides in our landscapes, it disrupts the natural balance. So we have pests and we have our beneficials. And a lot of those beneficials actually eat those pests, like nom on them, uh, like ladybugs. They love aphids. But if we come in with a pesticide that just is non-selective and it kills every insect, then you're going to have actually end up with your pests come back quicker than your beneficials. So what ends up happening is if you have an indiscriminate pest treatment, so just like I spray all my pests, my insects, all of a sudden you have no natural controls. And then you end up with a chemical dependence on use of pesticides within your landscape, which is a huge, huge issue. Whereas if we can just make sure that if we're using pesticides, we're using them properly. And this goes in, this has to do with insects, uh, predominantly insects in this perspective, but this relates to fungicides, all other types of pesticides that we use, not just insecticides. But um, that excessive use of any type of pesticide can have environmental uh, contamination, has potential health implications, and it can actually damage the plants. So there are some herbicides, like I mentioned earlier, that you can put down on your, your turf grasses and your turf grasses will be all right. But if you apply it maybe one too many times, that, that might be it that kicks the can for that plant because the plant can tolerate the herbicide. Doesn't mean it can withstand it. It can tolerate the herbicide, but eventually that can get killed or damaged by that herbicide in some situations. So indiscriminate pest treatment leads to no natural controls and it leads to a chemical dependence. So we're having those pests come back, but we don't have natural controls. So then the only thing we have left is that chemical application no natural controls. So it just ends up becoming a cycle. So one other uh, issue that we do have is a pest resurgence. So we kill, the, we still have pests that we kill with an insecticide, um, and, but there's still some that might remain and we don't have those natural predators. So in the days following the pesticide treatment, pests reproduce faster than predatory insects. So by killing beneficial insects, pest populations flourish to levels that are higher than the before treatment, which is obviously pretty bad. Um, and then what can end up happening is, whoops, what can end up happening is, is you go and spray, say there's an insecticide that's put down, um, and then you have that population come back again, well, you could put down that insecticide again, but then it's gonna start losing its effectiveness. Insects can quickly develop a tolerance to different insecticides. And if you don't rotate different modes of action, that's what we call it. Um, so it's like different families and insecticides or pesticides and how we're using them. If you don't rotate them, that insect will develop a resistance to that insecticide, which then all of a sudden you could be putting down pesticides or an insecticide in your landscape that has no use. It's not effective. So you're putting down something pretty significant in your landscape that has very low effectiveness. So it's really important that rotating those modes of actions of insecticides and pesticides is really important. So obviously going back, we don't wanna do this overuse because if we use too much pesticides, we're just gonna end up in a vicious cycle and you can fix this. You can fix this nonetheless. You ended up in this vicious cycle of indiscriminate pest treatment, no natural controls, chemical dependence, et cetera. And then you're gonna have this pest resurgence come in more and more quickly. So now you start to say, okay, so how do we manage yard pests, Taylor? So if we, if we are noticing that there's a problem with what we're doing with any type of pesticide implication, applications, what can we do to improve it overall or to reduce how we're using our insecticides or pesticides overall. So that's why we fall back on what we call the integrated pest management, so or IPM for short. So it is a strategy, not just University of Florida, this is like global strategy that people are using on how do we manage pests properly. So we think about the food pyramid. So the food pyramid, you have your breads on the bottom. It's the most important, you know, your fruits and vegetables, your meats, and at the very, very top are your sweets. You know, it's like, uh, 
you, you got to be careful with how much you have those. So every, every once in a while, it's totally fine. But when it's talking about a healthy nutritional diet, you can't just rely on the, the sweets at the top of the food pyramid. Um, so when we think about integrated pest management, we're thinking about, okay, how do we manage pests from a preventative perspective? And then if things get really bad, how do we intervene? So the goal is if we can prevent insects from the first place, cool. Or that, sorry, not insect, prevent pest in the first place, then that is going to help reduce any type of chemical application in our yard. And there could be a situation where you may never have to actually get to a chemical application because everything is managed for you by what's happening in your environment. And it starts with cultural controls. And then there's the physical and mechanical controls, biological. And then if all else fails, it's that chemical control. So we'll talk a little bit about each one. But it starts with cultural. But it's important when thinking about um, realistic expectations. You are going to have insects. There's nothing you can do about it. You're always going to have insects. It's part of living on Earth. <laughs> I was going to say just part of living on Florida, but I no, I think it's more true to say just part of living on Earth. You're going to have insects. They're always going to be there. You can't eliminate them completely. So you have to have realistic expectations that there's going to be insects. So what is that threshold? Some damage to plants is natural. It's going to happen. But if you see damage, doesn't mean it's the end of the world for that plant. You know, like a great example is I think a citrus leaf miner on citrus trees, you're going to have citrus leaf miner. There are problems if you get way too much of it, but you're going to have citrus leaf miner. That's all right. That's fine. You know, you may not have to do anything. You probably shouldn't do anything with a citrus leaf miner to a certain extent. So some damage is going to be natural and that's totally fine. That's, that's great. You know, that means that you have a living landscape. That's what landscapes do is live. Don't strive for a pest-free yard. It's impossible. It, that will never happen. You'll drive yourself crazy. You'll get gray hair, go bald. It'll all fall out because you're so stressed about it. But instead, decide on a realistic threshold of damage. And that changes from person to person. It really does. It's kind of more of a perception thing. So what is that realistic threshold of damage where it's like, oh, it still looks good. Okay, um, then that's that's fine. You might, the pest or that pest might not be too terrible terribly bad. So because a great example I can put in the context of turf grass. So weeds can be a pest in our landscape. So some people, they like to have a really nice turf grass, you know, and if they're managing it well, that's fine. Um, and they're following best management practices, that's fine. And if, but, it, but they may not like seeing a bunch of weeds pop up in that turf grass. And so they may try to like hand pull them, prune them out, et cetera, try to make that landscape look nice. But on the other end, you know, you can have someone like me <laughs> where I will have a yard. I will have my, my turf grass, but it's like, oh, it has some weeds in it. Cool. As long as it's non-invasive and I don't get in trouble by my HOA. Cool. You know, if it's green, it grows. That's fine. Obviously, clearly different expectations, <laughs> but it's important that there are thresholds of damage. What is your threshold? And make sure you set a realistic expectation because you will never be 100% pest free. That's impossible. So the first line of defense in the integrated pest management um, is to think about going back to right plant, right place. If a plant is happy and healthy in the landscape because it's the right plant for the right place, it's going to be naturally resilient to um, insect and pest pressure and damage. You'll get aphids on your plants that are happy, healthy in the landscape, but the aphids won't be a, too big of a problem. You might get scale or white fly, but the plants aren't going to be stressed about it. No problem. Um, so what ends up happening is by having these um, pest resistant plants or even some plants that are resistant to specific pests, um, it de significantly decreases the likelihood that you'll ever need to spray your landscape with any type of chemical or any type of um, insecticide or pesticide. Most plants can withstand small pest populations. So... <clears throat> It's also important to, as part of this prevention, is to do um, inspections. Don't try to predict when pests are going to be there. Assume that they are present. Um, you can't kill something that isn't there. Um, it's important to know the plants. Look at your plants. Study them. You know, as you're going through your yard and landscape, some plants because some plants may be sensitive to certain products, and you may not want to hit them with any type of herbicide or an insecticide or pesticide, whatever it might be. But always scalp, monitor your plants routinely, regularly. 
Um, you know, every seven to 10 days is the ideal time where you're looking at your plants. Like what I do is it's like, I'm just outside. I'll just, you know, walk by plants. I'll just inspect them very laissez-faire about it. It's like, okay, I don't see anything bad. Cool. Um, but my, monitor plants routinely just to aid in early detection. Because if I find, oh, there's a pest problem on this single twig that if I, and I see it now, and if I come back um, a week later, it could be on many twigs. So I can look at it and say, oh, okay. That could be a pest I might have to deal with. It's really easy to deal with it if it's on a single twig than many twigs in your landscape. So um, it's important to think about look for favorable conditions for pests. So stress plants, signs and symptoms is, you know, a common sign that the pest is there is you see the, the pest itself. Um, but look for leaf damage, leaf curling. Um, you can actually see signs of feeding. Um, like here's a great example in this image, you can see a ladybug munching on aphids, one of our lovely little predatorial bugs that loves eating our pests. Um, but also frass insect excrement, so honeydew, sooty mold. So that black film that we get on our leaves in our landscapes, that black film sooty mold is just growing on the honeydew, which is insect poop. So usually you find that that uh, honeydew or that sooty mold growing on plants, all you guys is just look up, look at the leaves above it or under the leaves um, and you will see the insects there. Um, so that's always a good um, indicator that there is an insect problem. But also look for a presence of natural enemies. So like a ladybug, if um, recently I was out at actually Egan's Creek and I saw a lot of ladybugs kind of flitting around some plants. And I'm like, oh, look at all these ladybugs. And then I'm like, oh, look at all these aphids. <laughs> so I, saw, I actually saw the ladybugs before I saw the aphids. And the ladybugs were going to town. So it's like, oh, natural predators. They're happy, healthy. Everyone's going to be, you know, the plants will be fine. Ladybugs will be happy and healthy. Um, and those aphids will go away. But anyways, so scouting is so important. So just keep an eye on your plants. Notice something that's irregular. Um, and see if you can find those signs of any types of pests that might be in your landscape. So going back to that prevention to intervention, cultural controls, right plant, right place, avoid problems with insects and diseases. So if we just follow best management practices for uh, maintenance, so excess of fertilizers, excess of irrigation can lead to plant stress, and all of a sudden you bring in insects. And that sometimes can be very kind of like, ah, because what happens is if you see a plant that looks unhappy, stressed, our instinct may be give it nutrients, give it fertilizers, or give it more water and irrigation. But in actuality, what we're doing is we're promoting that problem. We're continuing that problem in most, most situations. So avoid problems with insects and diseases. You know, always think right plant, right place. How do we maintain? How are we installing our landscape plants? Um, make sure that we're following just those cultural practices. If we follow those best management practices, then you're going to have a happy, healthy landscape. Stress plants are more susceptible to attack. From disease, etc., or if our turf grass is not healthy, or we're not managing it right, then you're going to have more weeds come in, um, or you might have more fungus kind of fungus uh, pathogens start to come into your landscape. So, um, like here's a stress plant in this image. That's actually a Chinese elm that's being uh, crowded roots, as the, all those bromeliads growing on top of it, and then it's in that raised little bed thing. That's not going to make those roots healthy. So that's going to be a stressed plant. So now with so cultural practices, if you follow your cultural practices, best management practices from UF IFAS, right plant, right place, your plants are going to naturally have a resistance to pest in the landscape. So, um, <clears throat> so let's look at, dump into that a little bit deeper. I know we're running out of time, but um, we're coming towards the end. But think about susceptible hosts. Some plants might be susceptible hosts to pests, and you learn about those like oleander, um, aphids love oleander. Um, and so plants might be the right plant for the right place, but if they're not being cared for properly, then it can end up being uh, attracting to um, <clears throat> that, that plant. So is it a problem plant to begin with? If no, or if yes, you know, if you have a plant that's just not working out, then maybe there's another plant they need to put into its, into its place. So um, pest problems are a symptom. So if we see pests in our landscape, that's a good indicator that there's a cultural problem. We're managing our landscape improperly. So that means, oh, if I'm seeing a fungus, then my landscape might be a little bit too wet. What am I doing? What do I need to do? Usually irrig cal irrigation calibration, making sure you're not over irrigating. Um, 
So usually they're an indicator that something is being managed wrong. So if we're seeing those pests, something's being managed wrong and we need to make that correction in order for it to go away. You can't just put down a pesticide and it just it's fixed, but no, what's the root of that problem? Fix that so then it doesn't come back. And water wisely, excess of moisture, that is causing so many problems within our landscapes. We irrigate too much um, when it's not needed at all. Um, our plants, majority of them are very drought tolerant and actually prefer being on the edge of drought. So we recommend actually turn your irrigation system completely off, completely off and only turn it on if your plants are showing signs of drought. Um, and that's the only time. And then it'll actually promote healthy root growth and it'll help protect that plant and it won't be too wet and it won't stress out. So water wisely. And if you're gonna irrigate, prefer to irrigate in the morning so excess water can uh, evaporate. If water sits on our leaves throughout the evening and night, higher chance of a fungal pathogen being able to pop up. Avoid overhead irrigation in any type of woody plants or ornamental plants. Uh, splashing of water will spread fungal pathogens uh, throughout a landscape. Very, very easier, easy. Um, and many foliar diseases gain entry into plants through the water remaining on the leaves. So you want that excess water to evaporate um, if, if there is some still within that landscape. So the morning is best, let that excess to evaporate. So now we're gonna talk about like the physical or mechanical control. So if we just follow best management practices to reduce our inputs, um, or sorry, best management practices, right plant, right place, you know, we're gonna have a very limited insect or pest problem. Um, you may still have pests come in, then it makes you say, okay, what do I need to do better? Um, and, but then there's still easy ways to remove them. So you can remove pests by hand, physical, mechanical. So like I was talking earlier, you can scout and you find one twig with an insect on it. It's easy to just remove that one twig. And then um, rather than waiting for it to go everywhere, you know, I can remove that one twig and I can dispose of it, throw it in the trash or, you know, whatever it might be. And pest managed, you know, it's great. Remove infested parts of plants, establish barriers to prevent pest access to plants. So that's a little bit harder for homeowners sometimes, um, but there are, um, excuse me, there are ways that you, like if you know there's pest sensitive areas, you can actually do planting barriers to help prevent other insects from coming in to a certain extent. Um, but other ways is you can actually do just little sticky traps. Yellow sticky traps actually attract white flies and other insects in your landscape. Um, and they can also help monitor pest populations. Really, really great within uh, greenhouses because greenhouse management is a little tough and it's awful if you get a disease or a pest inside of a greenhouse because it takes over pretty quickly. Um, but anyways, so physical methods. It's really easy to just go in and remove them manually. Next is biological control. So you do cultural management as a preventative, and then you're going to significantly reduce pests. But if they do pop up, you can go through that physical or mechanical removal of insects in your landscape. But then if that doesn't work, we still have biological controls where we can actually avoid using harmful broad spectrum in, uh, pesticides. Um, it allows us to, and one way to do that is we can attract those beneficials. So we can provide nectar and pollen and plant diversity, which brings in more of those uh, beneficial insects that help eat and gobble up a lot of those bad insects, like ladybugs munching on aphids or lacewings. Um, we can have air potato beetle that, that helps uh, eat air potato vine. So, and then we can prevent, provide extra sheltering. So we're attracting wildlife, we're attracting these beneficials to our landscape to help manage and um, our landscape. So we also have those, you know, predatorial species um, that like a predatorial mite, they are fast. They're really, really tiny, but you can see them scurry if you put them on a piece of paper. They are quick, but they are predators that we love to have in our landscape. And oh my goodness, they look ominous. <laughs> but they can help manage so many of our bad insects within our landscapes. And if we end up spraying non-selective broad uh, spectrum insecticides, we're going to kill these guys that are working for free, you know, um, and they help out significantly. 
So we have these natural predators and you can actually buy and release them. We also have some parasites that can actually kill a lot of insects, which is really neat. Um, they're very specialized um, and you can't always have success with them, but they do pop up on their own too, which is really cool. But look for a trail of bodies, essentially. You can find dead bodies like on the caterpillar on the left image, that's a parasitized uh, caterpillar. And those are kind of little wasps that are growing out of it, which is really cool. So exit holes, you can see color changes. So you can see on the bottom right, that's actually uh, their parasites that infect aphids. So aphids are typically a yellowish color, um, but once they're parasitized, they turn that red color. So it's like, cool, if you have aphids into red, mischief managed, you know, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> Um, but it's the yellow ones you have to manage. But um, so we have so many biological controls. Uh, and then we also have, there are pathogens um, that we can actually bring in that act kind of like a biological control a little bit to help manage them. There are um, naturally occurring insect diseases like that are bacterial, fungi, viruses, protozoa, um, and they can be very specific to host. They can have a lag time uh, in their effectiveness, but one of the most common um, controls that we use within our landscape that is kind of biological is BT, and that's a bacteria. Um, and a BT is a bacteria that actually is great for soft body insects, insects, and you can actually get little tablets that you can throw in standing water, rain barrels that are great for mosquito control um, but it's a neat little bacteria that's super super helpful and handy and it can manage a lot of our soft body insects within our um, landscapes and that's all biological controls so food for thought um, for biological controls many herbs and fragrant flowers actually attract natural enemies uh, so you can actually bring in some of these really nice um, uh, other plants like milkweeds, glardia, clover, dill, fennel, mustards, and um, it can help actually attract some of those beneficials um, into your uh, landscape even more. So, and then if that all fails, if cultural control methods aren't working, if physical mechanical controls you're trying and it's not working, uh, you have biological controls and you're trying your best to try to attract as many predators as you can to your landscape, um, and then you're using some of those other natural controls, then if all else fails, then we have that chemical control method. Um, and then there's certain chemical controls, insecticides or pesticides that we choose based off of the need. Um, sometimes most major pest damage reaches a level that is unacceptable to the observer and you can't manage it. If all pre previous managements don't work, um, usually it's the least susceptible, sustainable, it is the least sustainable method of uh, management. Um, and it is a last, control, last resort. There is no insect preventers. You're managing what you have in your landscape. Um, read the label for appropriate safety and directional usage. You know, if you're applying it yourself, um, make sure you're storing it properly, you're wearing appropriate PPE, mask, goggles, gloves, long sleeves, it's all listed on the labels. The label is the law with the application of any type of chemical pesticide. The label is the law. Um, but she, choose the least harmful pesticides, which is really nice. A lot of stuff that we can buy without a license is good. <laughs> or Well, better, um, I guess, to a certain extent. Um, but it's easier for us to manage. It's easier for us to store. Use selective pesticides that are for specific insects rather than broad spectrum because you don't want to kill those beneficials. Avoid the shotgun approach, which is spot treat only where the pest problem is. Don't, if you have insects in one spot, don't treat everything. Just spot treatment is going to be best. Um, and then follow the label exactly as written. Because if you under apply, it leads to pest resistance really quickly and it doesn't, not, it doesn't manage the insects. And if you over apply, you're managing the pest, but you're also over applying and it leads to uh, environmental problems. So, and make sure you label, at, you apply as written on the label. So, some other insect management strategies, we'll go through these really quickly. There's different sap suckers. Um, those are different types of aphids, soft scales, mealybugs, white flies. Those are things that are going to be kind of poking holes and sucking out stuff. There are biological controls. Horticulture, soaps, and oils are usually the easiest way to manage them. Um, caterpillars, like BT, that's an easy way to manage them in your landscape. Um, we have our plant chewers, like grasshoppers, beetles, leaf miners. Use a proper insecticide if damage warrants action, because there's a, sometimes some of those plant chewing insects 
uh, some of our um, do mechanical controls. And if you um, if they get overabundant, um, then you might have to jump to chemical applications. Here's a control cheat sheet that I put together. So horticulture soaps, that's always nice. That's always easy. That's an easy one to use in your landscape for homeowners that can manage a lot of bad insects um, in your landscape. Insecticidal soaps are wonderful. They help significantly. Um, and you can spot treat as needed where insects are bad um, if mechanical applications are not working. But biorationales, so like BT, parasitic nematodes, these are all things that you can get, ladybugs, wasps, that you can release into your landscape. Um, well, BT you can spray, but um, <clears throat> parasitic nematodes, ladybugs, wasps, you can actually get them from like landscape nurseries, et cetera, and release them out into your garden and the landscape to manage. Um, but another way to easily manage some insects is just a strong stream of water, like a scale. Like once you knock down the scale, most of the time they can't get back up on that plant. So um, you can just spray them off with a hose and then oh, problem solved. Um, and also shoes, you can just step on them, you can smoosh them. Um, that's an easy way to control them uh, mechanically. Um, but anyways, so this is a control cheat sheet for pesticide application. But, you know, we're thinking about pesticides. You start with cultural controls, best management practices. And then from there, it leads to physical, mechanical, then biological, and if all else fails, that chemical application. That keeps and makes and reduces how much insecticides or pesticides that we put down in the landscape. Um, and then what it does is when we get to that point where if we have to put them down, we're making sure that it's going to be as effective as possible because we're not stuck in that loop of dependence on the pesticides and insecticides. So anyways, so let's jump into those essential questions that I have. Um, so, you know, we learned about what that Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is. It's the nine principles to help conserve water, protect water quality throughout the state. Um, and it's how we're managing our landscapes. Why is it important to fertilize our landscape appropriately? That relates to nutrient pollution, nutrient runoff, nitrogen and phosphorus contamination leads to those algal blooms, which has a significant impact on our state's economy um, has a significant impact on our environment. Um, so making sure that we're fertilizing appropriately helps make sure that our landscapes are healthy, make sure that we're not wasting money by putting down too much, but we're also making sure that we're conserving and protecting Florida. Um, and we learned about how to landscape, how to fertilize landscape properly. So we talked about that spreading that fertilizer appropriately with the spreaders and then the landscape, how to manage landscape pests. We talked about integrated pest management, that cultural preventative to intervention chemical applications. So anyways, I know we're right at five o'clock, but I, we have some time for questions and answers. So feel free to put any of those within the chat box um, and the, uh, you can always reach out to me. You can reach out to the county extension office. We're here to help you all out. So if anything pops up and you're like, you know, I'm not 100% sure, call the extension office um, with how you can manage that landscape um, following the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. And I'm going to follow up with everybody um, later on in an email with a lot of information and content associated with this specific program today. So you'll get digital copies of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide, but also some basic information on pesticide and insecticide use, fertilizer use, um, relating to this uh, discussion as a good resource. So what app for measuring square footage for yard? I um, do not know off the top of my head. There's a lot of um, measurement tools just through the app store that I know that you can just search and you'll find a few. Just which one's free? <laughs> that's, what, that's what I do. Um, is it okay to apply pre-emergence for lawns under large oak trees? I would avoid it. I would avoid putting pre-emergence under oak trees because accumulation of herbicides can still cause damage to those roots. Um, so it would be best to avoid it. But if you have a large oak tree and it's like a big, um, and if it is a shaded area, those start to become the points where it's like, is that too much shade for turf grass to be 100% successful? So would that be better if possible to turn it into just more of an ornamental bed um, rather than like a turf grass area? That's a very good question. Um, what I want to pull up is, um, I'll go ahead and I'll close this. I'm going to do a different uh, screen share. Um, I, I wanted to show you all the dates of all of our programs 
for um, the crash course this year. So you can go ahead and just save the date and I'll send this, this uh, form out to everybody who registered today to make sure that you can register for the next programs. But, our, but we do this quarterly, so our next one's gonna be in April and it's gonna be more about, you know, we start off with right plant, right place, but how do we make sure that we're having our landscapes uh, to attract wildlife? Um, then in July, we'll have a program all about irrigation and water in the landscape, its role. And then on the 20th of October, we're going to have a program I call From the Ground Up, which really looks dives deeper into soil microbiology. <laughs> But really talking about the importance of soil within our landscapes and how important it is for making sure that like we have healthy landscapes to support the plants that we're growing. So feel free to register for these, but I'll send this flyer out to everybody as well as part of uh, the program today. Um, but just save the date. And they're all going to be from 3.30 to 5. I'll say ish because we went over today. Um, but anyways, so... Um, I'm still here for a couple, if you all have any some questions for a few more minutes, but um, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to pause this recording, or stop the recording, but I'm going to put this up on YouTube, uh, so you all can refer to back later.